My name is Elaine Fuchs. I'm a professor at Rockefeller University in New York City, and I'm also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. All of the tissues of our body must be able to replenish dying cells and repair wounds. We cannot get rid of those fundamental mechanisms. They're essential to life. And yet it's those mechanisms that cancers hijack in order to take advantage of, uh, of effectively the ability of our stem cells to be mobilized and repair wounds, this time doing it uncontrollably. So we study specifically squamous cell carcinomas. These are the second most common cancer worldwide. Uh, when we consider that squamous cell carcinomas are not only found in the skin, but also head and neck, cervix, esophagus, cancers of the anal genital tract, and some types of lung, breast, and breast cancers, as well as skin cancers. Now we're talking about the six most deadly worldwide cancer. And yet there's very few effective therapies for squamous cell carcinoma treatment. So what we've learned in the course of the field's studies on skin stem cells is that squamous cell carcinomas of the skin can originate from skin stem cells. They're there for the long haul so they can acquire the mutations that ultimately will lead to cancers and tumors. So some years ago, my laboratory isolated and characterized the tumor initiating cells, the so-called cancer stem cells, if you will, that are giving rise to squamous cell carcinomas, in this case, using our favorite model system, the laboratory mouse. The way in which we examined this was to generate a mouse that we could uh, effectively uh, create by chemical carcinogenesis or by genetics uh, skin cancers or squamous cell carcinomas. And we isolated those squamous cell carcinomas, fractionated their cells using fluorescence activated cell sorting, and then performed serial transplantation of each of the pools that we isolated from the fax machine, tested them one by one individually to find out which one or ones had activity that would lead to the generation of a new squamous cell carcinoma in a host recipient mouse. We got this down to almost the near single cell level where we could take a single cell isolated from a squamous cell carcinoma and introduce it into a host recipient mouse and get a squamous cell carcinoma. That told us that we had a so-called cancer stem cell. What does it look like? So we learned that the cancer stem cells produce a new set of transcription factors that are different from the normal stem cells. So the cancer stem cells produce ETS2, ALK3, AP1, KLF5, and SOX2 and 9 whereas the normal hair follicle stem cells produce SOX9, TCF4, TCF3, and FATC1, NFIB, and LHX2. There's very little overlap in the transcriptional regulators between the hair follicle stem cells and the cancer stem cells. One of the interesting new sets of genes that are uh, important in the squamous cell carcinoma cancer stem cells are the ETS and the ELK binding sites. These are present in nearly all squamous cell carcinoma super enhancers. Those are the regulatory elements that are controlling the activity of the stem cells. And those factors turn out to be phosphorylated and super activated by a particular kinase, the MAP kinase, that is downstream from, in this case, oncogenic RAS or hyperactivated RAS, which is frequent in squamous cell carcinomas. So the RAS MAP kinase pathway then phosphorylates and activates ELK3 and ETS2. And we don't yet exactly know how it works, whether it recruits histone acetylases or whether it increases the DNA binding affinity or the nuclear, nucleosome binding affinity for these transcription factors. But what we do know is that the phosphorylation and superactivation of these transcription factors is critical with regards to 
altered malignant program of gene expression produced by these stem cells. And we can also take advantage of cloning one of these regulatory elements that is turned on in the squamous cell carcinoma stem cell, and we can use that to express uh, a GFP, fluorescent green protein, in mice. And we just use a fluorescent red protein as, uh, as a control. Uh, but what we find is that the uh, uh, regulatory element now is specifically expressed in the squamous cell carcinoma cells. So we know that the skin stem cells from squamous cell carcinoma originate from the wild type skin stem cells, but they don't look anything like the, uh, the wild type skin stem cells. They have a completely different program of gene expression. They're expressing elevated levels of cyclins, which force these cells into a super proliferative state. They express transforming growth factor alpha, a growth stimulator for the squamous cell carcinoma cells. They express certain cell survival genes that are long-term survival genes, not normally expressed by the hair follicle stem cells or by the epidermal stem cells. They express uh, genes which give, uh, which are important for uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transitions for invasion. Um, they express uh, VEGFA that recruits blood vessels to these uh, stem cells, and so on and so forth. These are effectively a, a list of genes that are implicated in many types of cancers, and yet they're not properties of normal stem cells. So the cancer stem cells, as we're learning, reside at the tumor stroma interface. That's very similar to what I described to you for the normal stem cells. Epidermal stem cells and hair follicle stem cells reside at the epidermal dermal interface. And so too, now we're finding the squamous cell carcinoma stem cells reside at the interface between the epithelium and the stroma. But now, the stroma is entirely different. There are immune cells, there are altered fibroblasts, there are blood vessels, there are a whole variety of different changes in the tumor microenvironment that distinguish the stem cell microenvironment from its normal counterparts. So there's heterogeneity also that arises in the tumor microenvironment, and that turns out to influence their behavior. Wherever there is a blood vessel that comes up next to the tumor stroma interface, those stem cells now respond very differently because the perivasculature contains a growth factor called transforming growth factor beta, which is a member of the BMP superfamily of signaling factors. And now that signaling crosstalk between the perivasculature and the cancer stem cell changes the properties of the cancer stem cells, and it does so in a very important way. First, the stem cells become slower cycling as a consequence of receiving this growth factor. But more importantly, these stem cells become invasive, and that is a very nasty thing. So in order to be able to study this, we engineered a mouse to mark the TGF-beta sensing stem cells of the tumor in red, and we also engineered the mouse so that we could track the behavior of these TGF-beta sensing stem cells by activating them and their progeny, following their progeny, in green. And so as you can see from the tumor here, the green cells, the progeny, of the TGF-beta TGF sensing cells uh, became invasive and uh, broke down the basement membrane of the tumor and started to invade the stroma. What's interesting is that this stroma is where the blood vessels are that basically prompted this initiative effect. And so we think that it's these cells that are then the ones that get into the bloodstream and could be the roots of metastasis. Another interesting and important aspect from these studies turned out that the TGF-beta responding stem cells have an increased resistance to chemotherapy. So the drug of choice for treating squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck is cisplatin. And here we treated the tumor 
with cisplatin. And by day three, you can see the blue cells, which are the dead cells, are the majority of the tumor. But the red cells that are here, the TGF-beta responding cells, did not undergo apoptosis. Are they doing something? Perhaps they're just sitting there in the tumor. So in order to be able to determine this, we washed away the cisplatin and we activated the lineage tracing marker so that these cells are now green and all their progeny are green. If these cells are responsible for regrowing the tumor, the tumor should be green. And so we did that experiment and what we found is a green tumor. What this tells us is that by stem cells receiving this change in their microenvironment that prompts them to receive a TGF-beta signal causes them to become slower cycling, invasive, and resistant to chemotherapy. So what's the mechanism involved? And here there's probably multiple mechanisms. We've looked at one of those, and it involves a factor called NRF2. This is a master regulator of a pro pathway called the glutathione pathway, and I'll get to that in a moment. NRF2 is normally kept at bay by virtue of its association with an inhibitory protein, KEEP1. And in response to TGF-beta, P21 is upregulated. It competes for the binding of uh, KEEP1 to NRF2, and that then turns NRF2 into a stabilized activator of the glutathione regulatory pathway. The glutathione metabolism genes then go up in the cancer stem cells, and the ones that we identified that were up in the TGF-beta responding stem cells are those shown in red. So what's the glutathione pathway doing? The glutathione pathway is what normal healthy cells use to clear out nasty stuff, like cisplatin in the course of chemotherapy or reactive oxygen species in the course of radiotherapy. And so by upregulating the glutathione pathway, normally it clears out all sorts of nasty stuff from healthy stem cells, but here it's clearing out all sorts of nasty stuff from the cancer stem cells, the cells that we would like to get rid of. So is this relevant? I've told you about studies in mice. Are they relevant to human? So here we looked at the uh, glutathione expression program in squamous cell carcinomas of humans, and what we learned is that the glutathione pathway is upregulated in a small cohort of human patients with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And when we looked at the prognosis of that small cohort, that cohort with upregulated glutathione pathway genes turns out to be the cohort with the poorest prognosis, suggesting that this is an important finding that could help us in terms of uh, future treatments of cancer. So NRF2, the good and the bad. NRF2 is what is normally contained in broccoli, um, and in blueberries, and all the things that we're told are really good for our health. They are if we're healthy. But for tumor patients or cancer patients, antioxidants may not necessarily be a good thing, and it's something that is really going to bear uh, the need for future studies to be able to explore deeper into this. So how do we go from taking the findings that we've made to perhaps the clinics or to new therapies uh, uh, for the treatment of squamous cell carcinoma? Well, to this end, we've engineered isogenic strains or isogenic cells uh, that contain uh, the ability, a sensor, that allows us to look at whether or not the cells are experiencing TGF-beta or not. We've also engineered the cells such that uh, the uh, one type of squamous cell carcinoma cell has the TGF-beta receptor on its surface, and we've excised the TGF-beta receptor from the other cell, uh, making it or rendering it unable to respond to TGF-beta. So here's an example. The red reporter shows us nuclear red if TGF-beta signaling is on, and you can see that if we co-culture the TGF-beta receptor positive and negative cells in a dish, what we find is that when we add TGF-beta, 
Uh, the cells that have the receptor show nuclear red. TGF-beta is on and signaling in those cells. The green ones, TGF-beta is unable to signal. So now we can treat the cells with cisplatin. And what we see on the left-hand panel is that if you don't add uh, any TGF-beta and you just add cisplatin, you kill all of the cells as evidenced by the fact that they round up and die. On the right-hand side, if you treat the cells with TGF-beta, those cells able to respond to TGF-beta are surviving the cisplatin, much the same as what I described to you for the tumor. So we can also see uh, gamma 2AX, a sign of DNA damage. And again, DNA damage occurs in the cells that cannot respond to TGF-beta, and the cells that can respond to TGF-beta are refractory. So what this tells us is that basically now we can start to think about therapeutics that would be able to compromise the ability of these slow cycling cancer stem cells that have high levels of glutathione to be able to kill those cells in the presence of perhaps combinatorial drugs for, uh, for these cells. Uh, we also think that uh, it might be possible through combinatorial drugs and the use of uh, TGF-beta inhibitors in a, very com in a very specific way to first kill off the bulk of the tumor cells with uh, cisplatin, for instance, and then mobilize those cancer stem cells that are resistant with perhaps TGF-beta inhibitor drugs or antibodies, and then hit the tumor again with cisplatin to wipe out the mobilized activated cancer stem cells. So these are ideas that at the moment are just ideas, but we'd like to be able to take these ideas to the practice and ultimately to translational medicine. But there are many mutations, genetic mutations, that exist uh, within these uh, human squamous cell carcinomas, these solid tumors. And ultimately, we'd like to know which ones are cancer driving and which ones aren't. So again, my laboratory has said whether we could harness the power of fly and worms and uh, take advantage of fly and worm genetics, only apply it to the laboratory mouse could, to be able to screen through and find out which of the genes that have been mutated in cancer are actually causing the cancer. And so here, two of my uh, former lab members uh, Boba Baranya, who's uh, running his own laboratory at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Center, and Gula Lifshitz, who's a graduate student and is now postdocing uh, in a cancer laboratory, uh, came up with a method of uh, carrying out rapid genetics in mice. What they did was to take advantage of the fact that lentivirus only gets in to the very first cell layer that it sees, which right after gastrulation is the single layer of surface ectodermal cells that are going to give rise to the epidermis, the hair follicles, the mammary gland, the corneal covering of the eye, and uh, the sweat glands. And what they did was to then uh, put the mother mouse under anesthesia at nine and a half days of development, right after gastrulation with her pups, and basically use ultrasound to find the pups and then use a microinjection needle to be able to inject high titer lentivirus just in the amniotic sac, the fluid that the embryo is bathing. So in a non-invasive way, we expose the embryo to lentivirus. We now seal up mom, let the pups develop. In this case, we analyze the pups six days later, and what we find is that the lentivirus is now integrated stably into the mouse genome, and it only infected the uh, cells of the epithelium and did not get into the inner layers beneath it, the dermis. And what we find is that the red embryo, in this case carrying the lentivirus carried a red fluorescent protein, uh, is now nicely uh, infected over the entire mouse embryo epithelium. And when you look at a cross-section of the tissue, you see that the epidermis and the hair follicles but no other cells of the skin uh, basically were stably transduced with lentivirus. So what this allows us to do is put any gene we want or downregulate any gene that we want or CRISPR-Cas edit any gene that we want 
specifically in the skin epithelium, in a matter of days that used to take my laboratory years to accomplish. Ten years later, we've basically uh, been able to accelerate the pace at which we do research in the laboratory. We've now carried out uh, rapid functional genetic screens, genes for screening for what are the oncogenes in that group of different human mutations that are found in squamous cell carcinomas? Who are the tumor suppressors? Uh, what are the um, microRNAs that are drivers of squamous cell carcinoma? Um, and what genes are important in regulating the balance of growth and differentiation in the skin epithelium? These technologies and the advances that we've been able to make carrying out even whole genome-wide screens in mice, which were previously, just a few years ago, thought to be possible only in worms or in fruit flies. So I hope I've been able to give you the insights today of why my laboratory studies the skin and why we continue to use it as an important model to be able to uncover the basis of genetic disorders and also the basis of cancers and for the goal, the broader objective of basically making advances in the treatments of human genetic diseases. The work that we do is focused on mouse and there's always that need to be able to draw parallels between mouse and human. But those kinds of approaches are now possible. This is my laboratory. It's an international laboratory. Uh, of researchers from around the world who get together with a common goal, and that is to work together to be able to advance our knowledge of biology and ultimately to make advances that can be useful in the clinics and in the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries. Thank you.